your body, go crack. Let the baseline move, take it off of the map. We rock clouds every time we move. Boom, boom, clap, yeah, we got it like that. Kick drum, hit your whole body, go crack. Let the baseline move, take it off of the map. What's going on, people? It's that time of the week. Welcome to another episode of the in the hot seat, your boy JD Dye. The latest content here on Sky Sports alongside the Heat Check family, as always. So, checking in all the way from Cali, the sharpshooter, dime dropper, the NBA legend, DJ Armstrong. Look, <laughs> gem giver, the rim dunker, Lamar's professional basketball player, Obi Soko, and the NBA information connoisseur. Come on, you know the vibes. Yeah, you know where he is everywhere across the world, the double M, Mo Moonsey. What's going on, young kings? How's your week been? <laughs> It's beautiful. Let's get it, JD. The energy is high. Let's get it. We got a lot to get to around the horn in the NBA. Let's go. Let's go. Right, let's go. Like I was saying, as always, you have to catch the people up with the latest news. And at this stage, the NBA is still trying to control their plans after the concerns of the COVID-19 exposure force. Further postponements. We've seen a number of games postponed this week. So we need to catch everybody up with what's actually happened. And obviously the virus as expanding across the world and it's hitting everybody and we understand the extent of the global pandemic. But BJ, at this stage, when you're seeing postponements, what do you think the league should do in handling the COVID-19? Well, you know, we are guys moving in uncharted territory here as far as the NBA, what to do for health and safety of the players and to be very sensitive what's going on, not only here, but around the world. And, you know, right now, I think the NBA anticipated that the virus was gonna have a tick up and we're starting to see it. And it's really now starting to affect NBA games and they're having to postpone and cancel games. So what should the NBA do? I think they should continue to monitor the situation with great care and obviously be aware of what's going on. But more importantly, is continue to have health and safety at the forefront of every decision that they make. Because right now, guys, it seems to be going in a direction, the opposite direction of what we saw there in the bubble. But I think that was to be expected now that the, the teams aren't playing in the bubble and we'll continue to see and uh, make decisions as we go along. But as we know, guys, we don't know where this is going to go, but I think the NBA is continuing to monitor the situation and be very aware of what's going on and how this could go either way. Mo, the league office had a meeting yesterday with the general managers and they were sort of talking about some sort of immediate changes, like talking about a spike in, because of the numbers of COVID cases, they're talking about reports saying that there could be an elimination of shoot arounds in the morning before games and a reduction of overall practice numbers altogether and limitation of people in general that are allowed to interact with the players. How do you feel about these new regulations and how do you think the players will react? You know, I'm, I'm going to keep it 100 with you, JD. I'm going to say what I say every time when we're discussing this. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. So I've got really no idea. You know, I just have to take advice from, you know, the health professionals. And I know the NBA are consulting with, you know, those professionals who know exactly how to deal with what they're dealing with. And they're taking every precaution necessary to try and keep the players safe. Um, so, you know, in terms of the new regulations of less people interacting with the players, et cetera, et cetera, I think that's obviously a positive step. You know, the less chance of anything spreading to anyone is obviously better. Uh, but, you know, I do commend the league for, you know, trying to make this happen because we are going through, you know, 2020 was a tough year. 2021's got off to a tough start. And, you know, every time you turn on the TV, you're seeing, you're not seeing the most positive things. You're seeing the news and it's terrible things happening all around the world or even here at home in the UK. And, you know, the NBA is bringing a bright spark of joy into a lot of people's lives that I think a lot of people need right now. So I'm grateful and I'm thankful for the players that are going out there with the dedication to play this season through, but obviously I would never want to jeopardize the health of any of the players or their families or any of the staff or anyone involved in the game. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not a scientist or a doctor. I don't know. I couldn't say, I couldn't share an opinion on that. I'm going to trust in the NBA and Adam Silver because they know, you know, what's best. It brings the question of Ovi automatically because of the postponements we've seen already in terms of games. Should we consider a one or two week pause as we're seeing sort of the spikes and increase in numbers of these COVID cases? Because naturally the tracking just doesn't seem to be working at this moment in time. I think it's a really tricky one, to be honest. You know, obviously the NBA has tried to put a bunch of protocols in place um, in order to protect the players. But uh, when you see, you know, we're dealing with uh, a sport that doesn't have so many players available. So 
when it hits teams, it's, it's, it's causing a greater impact. You're seeing American football is still able to continue um, at the collegiate level and at the NFL level. But obviously with the NBA um, and only a roster of 15 spots, it's, it's a lot more difficult. Now, with putting on any kind of postponements, that's another, a whole, a whole different issue in itself because obviously you're talking about losses in, in money. Um, and, you know, the longer these guys are sitting out, the bigger they hit. So I, I, I'm not sure what the answer is at the moment, but I am sure that Adam Silver and the rest of the guys at the NBA are um, doing their best to try and come to, the, to a solution that sort of helps everyone out. Look, guys, this is incredible. And obviously, we know it's a developing story here in the NBA. But as Mo said, look, we trust Adam Silver. We trust the direction that the league is taking at this moment in time. But before we move on, I just want to acknowledge the impact of the WNBA players and how their growing influence has made both an impact off the court as well as they do on the court. Remember in the bubble, people, when the WNBA players were wearing those shirts saying justice for Breonna Taylor and, and vote more than anything else for Warnock. You've seen now the impact directly and how they've impacted the state of Georgia by pushing Raphael Warnock to become the first black Senate in that state of them. So congratulations to the pushing forward with those powerful moves. But gentlemen, no, those ladies, they'd be enjoying this part as everybody does enjoy this part of the show. So let's dive into the hot topics, man. Let's do hot or not. Look, the first hot take this week is going to be slightly controversial. But let me land. As you can see it below, Jokic for MVP. But guys, I want to see everyone's <laughs> face when I say this. Because I need everybody to understand where I'm coming from. Yeah? Jokic went from, let's say, uh, nerds or statistics sort of fan favourite to a bona fide superstar. We saw it last year in the playoffs what he did in the Western Conference Finals. This year, he's averaging a triple-double. So what I'm going to tell you, we know the NBA pushes narratives. Nikola Jokic is and should be the favourite right now for the MVP title. BJ Armstrong, since you've got so much to laugh about, tell me why you're laughing. Are you taking it? Jokic for MVP. Oh, okay. No, I'm not taking that, Jay. It's like 10 games into the season. I mean, we had... Losses of 50 or more points by numerous teams in the NBA. I mean, it seems like every game is a 20 or 30 point blowout. More games have been a 20 to 30 point swing than I've ever seen in my entire involvement in the NBA. Look, I love Jokic. I love what he's doing. I thought he had a amazing experience in the bubble. And he's clearly one of the top 10 players now in the NBA without question. But 10 games into the season, we're already pushing this narrative. That's a little quick. It's a little quick, but, you know, let's let's play a little bit. Let's figure out who's who. I mean, this NBA this year has been one of the wackiest seasons I've seen in history. I mean, the way the swings are, 20 points, 30 points, you know, this playing back-to-back. -back, I mean, it's really been a very unusual season. But 10 games in, I'm not ready to say Jokic just yet for uh, MVP. Spoken like a true god. Mo, bring back the big man. That's what I'm telling everybody, yeah? <laughs> bring back the big man. This man has asserted himself as the modern day big. Vertical dominance, touch at the rim, ability to shoot from outside. Mo, I'm pushing this narrative and get on it early. Jokic for MVP, <laughs> do you agree? Yeah? <laughs> JD. JD, where'd you, where'd you get these takes from, bro? Come on, listen, listen. Look, I got, everyone knows I got love for Nikola Jokic. I got love for the Denver Nuggets. He's putting up amazing numbers. But if the MVP award is for triple doubles, then Russell Westbrook should have his trophy cabinet stacked up with some more than he already has. The Denver Nuggets are a 500 team. They're five and five. As BJ said, it's early in the season. But let's look at the teams. They, they've won five games and they've lost five games. Look at the teams they've beaten, okay? They've beaten the Timberwolves twice, and the Timberwolves are coming out and looking like one of the worst teams in the NBA. They beat the Rockets early in the season before they had a fully healthy roster. They beat the New York Knicks, who I know they had a few good games, but they're still the New York Knicks. And they beat the Sixers, who had seven players active on their roster that night. That's their five wins. Are you telling me that you want... 
<laughs> the MVP of the league. And those are the only guys he's beaten. He lost to the Kings when he threw the turnover that they got the fast break layup. And then he lost to um, the Clippers. They lost to the Suns, lost to the Mavs, and they lost to the Kings again. So anytime they come up yeah. against an opponent that's relatively okay at basketball, <laughs> it's not gone their way. <laughs> I, and you're telling me this is the MVP caliber. It is the MVP. No, come on, man. Let's be serious. Like BJ said, it's early in the season. You can't really be giving out this award. But if I was to say the early leader for MVP, for me, that's LeBron James. The Lakers are the best in the West. He's putting up great numbers. I think LeBron right now, he's putting up 24 points a game and he's playing a career low 32 minutes per night. So for me, LeBron's leading the MVP. And then if we're talking about big men and the MVP award, Joel Embiid came out. And with the exception of one game against the, the Sixers, he's really come out and looked like the MVP out of all the big men in the league. So, no, so Nikola bonus. Jokic. Yes, a bonus as well. He's been balling out. But Nikola Jokic, he needs to beat some decent teams first before, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, you can put on numbers against whoever, but you got to win. That's what this league is about. It's about winning. You're a 500 team. They can't play defense. That's my whole thing. You know, you got to be able to play on both sides of the ball as well. So as much as I love watching Nikola Jokic, he's a magician with a basketball. You know, he's one of the most exciting players to watch in terms of what he can do. And I've got no doubt that he's going to have a great season and the Nuggets are going to improve. But right now, I think you're crazy to suggest that he's the MVP. <laughs> I just want these days, I just want these days noticed, yeah? So when everyone jumps on the bandwagon later on, I don't want no, I don't want no hater in. I don't want, Joe, producer Joe, clip this up. Yeah, clip this up. Hey. If Obi, they start beating the good teams, national, then okay. Nationwide traction for Nikola Jokic, yeah? <laughs> Look deep into those inner analytics. Understand where I'm coming from. I'm telling you, the purity of the game right now, he's the most valuable player in the league. Do you agree with my hot take? <laughs> 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 You, you, hey, JD, you a good guy, you know. You, you're tripping, though. You're tripping. Now, now, now. As much as much as I 100% disagree with what you're saying, I think later on down the season, I don't think it'll be crazy to say that he could be in that race, though. He could be in that discussion. Um, yeah. I think I think Nikola I think Nikola Jokic, the way he he plays, his style of play, I can definitely see him keeping it up. You know, he plays. Um, he plays with his mind. He plays with his head, you know. He doesn't play an overly physical game. He doesn't exert himself too much. Um, and, and and he's got an extremely high basketball IQ with guys around him that are developing and are coming along quite well. So I definitely don't think it's wild to say, OK, he could be one of the possible candidates later on down the season. But after a couple of weeks, like, it's, it's madness, you know. I, I, I think after... <laughs> After a couple of weeks, LeBron James is 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 clearly the guy that you're you're gonna you're gonna put in that sort of uh, discussion, if anyone at all. But yeah, it's it's, it's too early, man. It's too early, JD. I'm I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not gonna beat you it. down anymore. I ain't gonna beat no, you down anymore. I'm out here fighting but... for the small franchises that don't get the recognition they deserve, <laughs> and also the big men which we're moving further and further <laughs> away from. <laughs> the the finals, I'm out here fighting for the small franchises that don't get the recognition they deserve, and the big men that are continuing to put up production every yeah. night. Eighteen dimes, Mo. Eighteen dimes. We watched this year already. I'm a big man. Don't make you an MVP. I don't make you an MVP. It's fantastic, but JD, who was that against? I mean, look, you could only. These are all <laughs> NBA players. You could only play who's in front of you. Let's see what the people turn around and say. That's what I would turn around and say to you. We put this out here to the people. The, the tweet was out there. Who is the best big man in the league right now? And listen to what the people are turning around and saying. I'm JD. Into you. I'll put it like this. I'll put it like this for you, JD. I'll put it like this for you, okay? If the season ended today, could you really vote for Nikola Jokic to be the MVP with his team having a 500 record with the games that I mentioned earlier being their only wins? Is that the MVP? Because I've got no doubt he's got the talent. If Denver get it together at the end of the season, maybe they can improve and he can be in that conversation. But if we look at just purely the 10 games that have gone on so far, there's no way you can tell me that the MVP can play on a team like this. There's no way. Mo, You've got to be on a, Mo, a winning franchise. We know it comes down to two things when it comes down to the MVP. The narrative 
and the production. I'm pushing this narrative. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, but, 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 but let me tell you. But, but also, this you, you yes. put out a question: that, Who's the best big man? Like it, that's not the game anymore. You know, we're in a, it's a guards league now. You know, the old teams are, See, are moving to, right uh, to, to, to under. Yeah. You know, guys are playing small ball a lot more. So there might only be probably like five centers that you could legitimately say, okay, who's the best out of the only four or five big men that are in the league? Like, you know, that's that's not where the game's played anymore. It, it's a guards league. So, um, yeah, I don't, All right, know, gents, I don't know if that... I'll give you that one. The first one you're saying is cold. But this one, right. I know is going to pull on some heartstrings. Yeah. When the news came across the timeline in the offseason that the Charlotte Hornets have swooped in and stolen... Gordon Hayward on a four-year deal, 120 million. We all immediately was like, whoa, that's a bit of shock. But I'm telling you now, looking at the way the Hornets have started this season, I'm convinced that he's actually worth that contract. Now, Mo Moonsey, you know full well where Gordon Hayward left. <laughs> I need to hear your opinion on this. Is Gordon Hayward worth that contract? You know, I'm going to agree with you on this one, JD. I'm going to agree with you on this with the caveat, though, that he is worth this contract right now. This season and in the last four games that the Charlotte Hornets have gone undefeated, Gordon Hayward's been averaging almost 30 points a night. He's been playing insane levels of basketball. I don't think anyone expected him to produce at this level. And he's shooting a high percentage as well. He's shooting like, you know, crazy levels from downtown as well. He's really been a huge factor for the Charlotte Hornets team. And we know how efficient he is and we know how much he helps his teammates as well. That's why you're seeing guys like Lamelo coming into his team and being able to flourish because Gordon, he's not going to dominate the ball in the way that other, other star players do. You know, he knows how to play his role. So, yeah, I definitely agree that he's worth his contract now. Bearing in mind, he makes $28.5 million this year. That's the 35th highest contract in the NBA. If we have a look at guys that are making more than him, Andrew Wiggins, Porzingis, who's barely played, Siakam, Kevin Love... Mike Conley, all these guys are making more money than Gordon Hayward, who's coming out and out producing all of them. Now, I do want to say this. I feel like every player in the NBA is deserving of their contract because they've all worked hard to get there and they've all secured their bag in their own way. So I can never disrespect anyone who's making their bread. I can never say that anyone doesn't deserve it. But I'm saying right now, the Charlotte Hornets have got an absolute steal of a deal with the way that Gordon Hayward is producing. Now, when I said there was a caveat, the only thing is this. We've seen how he struggled to maintain his health over the last few seasons. Injuries have been a big problem. And he's 30 years old and there are four seasons on this contract. So with the contract being set up the way it is, it increases in value every year. And the final year, the contract is 31.5 million, when I believe it's going to be the age 34. If I was the Charlotte Hornets, I would have almost front-loaded the contract and paid him more this season with it going down and down every year. So that way in the future, you know, you have a little bit more flexibility. But I feel like it's a good value deal if you can stay healthy. The thin line that Mo forgot to include there, Ovi, which I'll send your way now, is that Gordon Hayward actually left Boston this offseason because he wanted a larger part of the <laughs> offence. <laughs> he, also he, he also, he also wanted more Boston. control after the emergence of both Tatum and Brown. Yeah, that's, that's the thin, thin line that Mo somehow conveniently left off. Now, looking at the possibilities of what you're seeing Gordon Hayward do this year, are you agreeing with my hot take? Is he worth that contract? Uh, I, I think he is. You know, I think he is. Um, not only has is he obviously gotten off to a hot start, um, I think we forget, like, the player he was emerging into when he left the Jazz, you know, he, he was, um, you know, he was a developing player that had a lot of promise. And, and obviously, before his, his unfortunate injury, um, he was the guy. He, he was one of the guys over at Boston, you know. It wasn't supposed to be Tatum, you know. He was supposed to come up behind him, and, and I doubt he probably would have gotten the same opportunity um, had he stayed healthy. So, you know, the potential's always been there. I, I don't think this is a guy that we're looking at and saying, oh, all of a sudden he's, he's fallen out of the sky. And No, no, no. This is a guy who he was supposed to be that guy at a team, and, and, and a young talent came in, a young buck, that was hungry and, and, you know, fair dues to Tatum. He's obviously um, turning out to be a terrific player, but I think this is the perfect situation for him. Do I think he's worth that money across the board on any NBA team? 100% not. But if you look at what the Charlotte, um, um, the Hornets have, and, and you look at their personnel and what they need, I think he's perfect. I think he's a player that he's, he's obviously a veteran. He's been around the NBA a while. The way he plays, um, he's a very smart basketball player. He's played 
under Brad Stephen for years, um, including his college career. <clears throat> and, and this is a guy that I think will bring some some balance to, to a pretty young Hornets team that likes to get up and down and they might get out of control at times. I think he's going to be that piece that you, the coach can trust out on the floor to sort of calm those guys down. I've seen some of their games and, and the coach is really using them all over the place. Um, he's putting them in, in ball screens as the initiator. He's, um, he's, he's bringing the ball up as, as the primary initiator. He's playing off the ball. Um, he, he's doing a lot for those guys and he's going to crash the boards and do all the little things too. So I, I definitely think he's, he's worth the money, not just because of the productivity he's, he's putting out at the moment, but um, yeah, like this, this is a guy that, that, I mean, he's a, he's a big time talent. You know, I, I don't think we should forget just because he was just on a team with probably two wings that are going to be amazing in the future, you know? So yeah, yeah I, I think for the Hornets, BJ, with the chance for him now to be the primary option once again, I think Gordon is trying to remind everybody what a talented three-level scorer looks like and how efficient he can be on the floor. But there's a reason why we call you the damn getter on this show, because you get people the bag <laughs> both on and off the court. Yes? So I need you to ask the question, do you agree with the hot take? Yes? Well, when you ask that question, you know, I was waiting to hear what my what my partners in crime were going to say here. And my answer is this, unequivocally, yes, he is worth it. And here's why, because someone was willing to pay him, pay him. that much money. <laughs> that, that's why he was worth it. Okay. Now, if you want to find out what you're really worth, go to the free market. That's exactly what he did. And he found a team. Now, Gordon Hayward suffered a horrific injury a couple of seasons ago. And no one in this league that I've spoken with, executive players, have said otherwise. When he is healthy and when he's playing in between the lines, Gordon Hayward is a terrific player. You know, he's arguably one of the top 15 or 20 players in this league consistently. Now, he suffered injuries. He's had health there in Boston, and it didn't work out. But we had every reason to believe it was going to work out playing for his former coach that he played for in college and he was able to figure out and reduce his role and reduce whatever he was contributing there in Boston. Now he's back playing, he is healthy, but most importantly, I think he's found a system and a combination that works for his game. Gordon Hayward is a terrific athlete. He can score, he can shoot, he has a great body, he can play inside, outside, and he's a very cerebral player. So I like him. I like the number that they got him at. And I think because he will take care of his body and he's a pro's pro, he will continue to play and age gracefully in this league because of the way he plays. He plays very slow. He's not like his game isn't all athleticism. His game isn't all built on speed and quickness. I think this was a great contract for them. And more importantly, they got a great player at that number when you look around the league today. So I thought it was a great pickup for them. It has paid dividends. I think they're on a four-game winning streak. And the combination with where he's at as a veteran, along with the youth they've added, it seems to be a great fit for him. And more importantly, they're allowing Gordon to come in and do what he does. He is a professional scorer. Make no doubt about that. Love the pickup. Great job. And uh, we'll see how it continues to play out. But I thought that was a great pickup for the Charlotte Hornets. Spoken like a true agent. I love it. Moments. <laughs> hey, 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 BJ, BJ, is that one of your guys? Is that one of your guys? He's not one of my guys. He's not one of my guys. I wish he was one of my guys. Hey, I, hear that. I wish he was hey, one of my that. guys. I mean, that was, uh, that was a great pickup for them, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I look, I want to go to the last hot take. And as you know, in this segment, we always choose the viewer's hot take. And I couldn't leave this one out because when I saw this one come across the timeline, I had to assess it at first. And I thought about it. Then I weighed up the numbers. And I actually agree with it. That's my boy, Rob Rush. Yeah, 99. I see you, my bro. And I'm actually going to put it out there. Jalen Brown, averaging right now a career behind the arc. Averaging 26 points while doing so. Jason Tatum. We all know how primary teams are setting their defensive schemes to stop him, and they still can't stop him averaging 27. Right now, they're looking like a top three duo in the league. 
Mo Mooncy because I know you're tuned in to watch these guys every week. Every week, I know you're breaking down the analytics on these two. So are they a certified top three right now in the league? That ain't even a question, JD. That ain't even a question. <laughs> My boys are balling. Come on, top of the Eastern Conference. Both of them top 10 scoring in this league. You know, that in the last 20 years, through the first 10 games, no one's put up this many points. You know, they've, they've combined together to each score 250 plus points through their first 10 games. The only other duos to do that were Kobe and Shaq and Stephen Curry and Kevin Durant. So when we put that into context, these two are balling at an elite level. And, you know, you're saying top three, but if you really looked at it without the player names attached and you just looked at the production that they're bringing, man, it might be harder than top three. It's top three and they're not three. I'll tell you that much right now. They're, they're not third. Oof. They're second. Oof. Maybe pushing Ooh. for first the way that they're playing. <laughs> so who you that's get? all I'm going to say. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who, who you going Mo, Mo, Mo. Who you got? Just give me your list. The floor is yours. I just want to know who your list is, right? I mean... I'm going to assume that we're all going to say LeBron and AD is on the top of the list right now. Yes, sir. Of course. And then these guys are a second behind them. Oh, whoa. Listen, oh. look at it. Look oh. at the production oh. in the first 10 oh. games oh. without the names <laughs> attached. If you look at these 10 games in a vacuum without any reputation or former champion or this or that or this, if you just watch the 10 games in a vacuum and what these guys have done, you got to factor in the first game of the season – my boy Jason Tatum, he hits that sidestep behind the arc, pull up over the defensive player of the year and the MVP of the league to win the game. We're talking about balling at an elite level. They haven't got blown out by 50 points like other duos in this league. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> they're up there. Top two. Top two. I don't want to hear it. Back and they're top of, they're, they're, Arms- listen, they're top of the Eastern Conference as well. It's not like they've been putting up empty numbers like the other conversation we're having earlier on in the show. You know, in the words of my boy HP, we are winning. We are winning. <laughs> so that, you know what I'm saying? That's that. That's, that's all I got to say. We're not top three. We're top two. We are top two, and that's that. Shout out to the boy Harry Pinero. Yeah. BJ Armstrong, <laughs> you seem like you were debating this one. So I'm just going to come to you straight. Well, I'm not three. really debating because I, 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 really, I really love those kids. When I say, I don't know why I'm calling them kids, but I really love Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. I mean, I'm watching their careers and they are well on their way to ascending to a very high level. Do I think they are the top two in the league as of yet? No, but I like the direction that they're moving in. You know, when you watch CJ McCollum and you watch Dame Lillard, you know, when you watch Anthony Davis and you watch LeBron James, I don't think they've ascended to the level of LeBron James and those guys yet. But I like the way they're trending. I like the way they're moving. I like uh, I like those young players. But I'm not ready to anoint them just yet. Right now, 10, 11 games into the season, I want to give it some time, let it mature, because with this, these accolades, with this – comes expectations and right now I don't I'm not anticipating this team to come out of the east right now as of yet as the roster is currently constructed but I like their players I like them in the in the in the mix but I'm not ready to say that those two are ready to just carry players along with them like an AD or LeBron or what have you what I've seen thus far especially this stage of their career. Over the question has been more over probably Jalen Brown and his growth let's say over the last 12 months has been nothing more than astronomical look where do you rank this duo because Jason Tatum has proven himself over the last 18 months as a consistent scorer in this league and a and a three level doing so but Mo made some good points I mean he's saying they're higher than let's say the, I mean, the duo in the look, 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 look. he said they're higher than the duo in Portland he said that there's hear, only I hear, eight I hear, I hear you, I hear you. But I hear you I hear you where look, you at at the end of the day they're, they're, they're clearly extremely talented. These are going to be two of um, some of the best players in the league in the coming years. That's a fact. We all know that. And and as long as they keep on going in the direction they're going, they're going to be terrific. The Boston Celtics are in great hands. But to say today, right now, off the first 10 games, the first way we couldn't say Jokic is an MVP or we can't come out and make any other wild statements, um, I, I think it goes the same for this situation. Now, have they gotten off to an absolutely amazing start? Yes. But have we seen this kind of 
production from Jalen throughout a whole season yet? No, we haven't. You know, he's clearly emerging and he's getting better and better, I think. Uh, I think the both of them are getting better and better, but we haven't seen it consistently at the left. Like, he, he's doing career, he's having career highs. So, you know, we, we have to see how everything develops. But I just think there are two that are in contention to be in the top three. I just wouldn't flat out say, oh, yeah, they're top three, boom. Mo, I expect him to say that. He's a Boston fan. Cool. And he makes very good reason. <laughs> Let me finish, Mo. Let me finish. I didn't say a word when you were speaking. I didn't say a word. But, <laughs> but, but, but look, but look, but look, but look, 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 look. But you got, um, Porzingis has obviously been, been unhealthy. He hasn't been able to stay healthy. He should be back soon. And, you know, with him and Luca, that's a very, very dynamic duo. That's an interesting two. You've got CJ and, and Dame up in um, Portland. You've obviously got PJ and Kawhi. You've got Kawhi who's already won a championship. He's proven. Obviously not as a duo, but I'm Brooklyn, saying Brooklyn, that too. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah, I, I, Brooklyn. Let me get there. Let me get there. Let me, let me get there. Jeez. <laughs> I don't want to talk in Obi's turn. <laughs> you know, and then you've obviously got KD and Kyrie who are two players. Okay, we don't know how it's going to pan out as as a duo and how they're quite going to work together long term. But their two talents individually, they're just so incredible as individual players. I mean, that the productivity from those two is through the roof. So you've got all of these other guys that I don't think you can just clearly say off of 10 games, Jalen and um, your boy Tatum are just head, um, head and shoulders above those guys. Like, no, no. You know, I think they are definitely in that discussion. And, and I think there's an argument there, but there is a couple other duos in the NBA that you have to pay respect to. You can't just write these guys off. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, um, uh, and, and all of these duos, you know, they're, they're all expected to be playoff teams. Obviously, you know, Boston have gone off to a great start, but again, season is young. So I, I wouldn't just clear cut, put them in the top three. No, 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 no. All right. Is my I'm time. done, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Ah, cool. I'm done. My, I didn't my want to interrupt. You know, saying, you know what I'm saying? I, I didn't want to interrupt because you said, Mo, don't, I, I didn't say a word at that point. Because I've seen you. I, I, just you. Get the, I just want to get the logical <laughs> consistencies going on here. We all dismiss JD's first take because of Nikola Jokic and the Nuggets not yeah. being successful through the season so far. And we said he has the potential to do it later in the season. But right now, mm -hmm. he's not the MVP because of how he's played through these 10 games. Okay. But yet, yeah, when it yeah, comes yeah. to Jalen Brown, you're saying they're not top top three duo because you don't know if he can do it for the rest of the season. You're, all of the duos that you've listed, you're either going on future expectations or past achievements. You're saying, Porzingis and Luca can't be the top three duo because Porzingis hasn't been on the court with Luca. Katie and Kyrie, Kyrie's been missing for the last five games. We're talking about Paul George and... Are you telling me that game that we covered on, on Sunday? Are you telling me that the Boston Celtics would have let the Chicago Bulls go so close with them, just like those two did? Do you know what but I'm this, saying? This like, a and it was a wise individual brilliance that won them that game in the third quarter. It wasn't the duo pairing. It was Kawhi going off for a crazy third quarter. So, yeah, Kawhi Leonard might be more talented than Jalen and Jason, but as a duo, as a duo, if we base it, as I said at the start of what I was saying, if we base it on the 10 games we've seen, if I showed you all of these games, but you couldn't tell which player was which, and you couldn't tell if, if all the team's jerseys were blanked out, and you couldn't tell who was who, or I showed you the numbers and you couldn't tell who was who, you would say that these guys are the best in the league. BJ, I accept your point about Dame and CJ. Offensively, maybe they're ahead, but the great thing about Tatum and Brown is they do it on both sides of the ball. They both lock in as defenders. Portland have one of the worst defenses in the entire NBA, even though they made great additions to their defense in the offseason. So we're talking about top three duos, cool, but we're talking about both sides of the ball, not just the scoring side. You can't tell me Luke and Paul Zingis, Katie, when talk these guys are all missing games. Talk about winning games. They've been there. They're top of the Eastern Conference. We're talking about winning games. They're top of the Eastern Conference yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah, but so, my so point is, how are they, they're, they're certain duos. Who do you, have, who do you have above them? Who, I want to know. Who, Kyrie, who Kyrie, and Kyrie and KD. Kyrie and KD, I've got them above them. I've got um, LeBron James and of that's clear. Dame and, and CJ, I think that's an argument. I think PG and Kawhi, that's an argument. I think um, once Paul Zingas gets back, what those guys, what, um, what the Dallas Mavericks are able to do on offense and their offensive output that we've seen last year, how much points were they? They put up 150 or 140 something. Like their offensive output, 
Their, 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 their offensive output, this there's is some people, there's, there's some, no, 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 there's some guys like Stephen Curry, I don't need him to be able to play defense because their offense makes up for it. And at the end of the day, as much as defense does win championships, and I'll harp on about that, but you, you have to score more points. Whoever wins, whoever scores more points wins <laughs> the game. So, so at the end of the day, I hear what you're saying, but my point is not that they're not a top three. My point is that there is an argument. You can't just say that they're clear cut off of 10 games. And you can't just pick and choose and say, well, if I'm going just off 10 games for this, and then just two arguments ago, you say, well, we can't just go off 10 games. Don't just pick, don't just pick and choose what no, makes sense for your no, argument. You're, you're confused. You're confused. You're confused because just five minutes ago, talking about Jokic, I said based on the 10 games we've seen. And then when we come to this one, I'm saying based on the 10 games we've seen. You're coming with this. Watch when Paul Zingis comes back. How could you be a top two duo in the league if you haven't played yet? You ain't even put your sneakers on. What are you talking about? They, they played, they played the some games last season in which they put up big numbers. We're not in last season, though. They, they, I moved forward. We're in this season right now. And Brown and Taylor oh, have been playing at a better level as a duo than everyone aside from LeBron and AD. I don't know okay, how you're not yeah, saying okay. this. I, I, honestly, I'm not saying it's I not didn't my say, team. I didn't they say there's not an argument. Team in the league. I didn't say they're not. The when argument did I say is, that is not? whether they're second or not, but they're clear-cut top three. The argument is whether they're second uh, or third, ooh. but they're clear-cut top three. I, 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 I just said that there's an argument. That's all I said. I didn't say they're not. What, I just said it's an argument. That's all. And if you're saying that there's no argument, fair enough. All I'm going to say is there's still a long, long way to go in this season. And this argument, I have a feeling, will come back up again. No two ways about it. There's also a duo in Golden State. We seem to have just forgotten about conveniently. But what do we talk? What do we know? What's generational talent nowadays? Yeah. Like in this week's off court, we were reviewing right. just that legendary like generational talk, talent. I have to ask you like, a quick question. Have you ever had that saying that your parents say to you, these kids just don't know basketball? Like, I feel like my dad and my brothers <laughs> just say that to me all the time, my whole childhood. Oh, you don't know basketball like I know basketball. You're not a student in the game like I know this. This is not your era. We're not privy to this. You don't know greatness. That's fair enough. Because greatness before its time is exactly what should be labelled to the person we're going to discuss in this week's OG series. Because I've had to watch the archive tapes and I've had to really appreciate it, what greatness was. And Philly's Dr. J man, that boy could ball. And I'm still asking myself to this day, how did you make that legendary baseline scoop move, man? A huge part of the NBA's global appeal is the flair, the posterizing dunks, the showmanship style in putting up points on the scoreboard. And much of that owes to one player in particular, the doctor, Julia Serving. With his monster dunks and endless well of creativity, Dr. J made the sport a spectacle. Doc's professional career started in 1971, not with the NBA, but with the ABA, a short-lived alternate league operating in America at the time. Signing with the Virginia Squires, Irving burst onto the scene with two extremely prolific seasons, making a name for himself early with flashy moves and hard dunks over defenders. Following a move in 1973 to the New York Nets, a team based moments away from his childhood neighborhood of East Meadow and Roosevelt, Dr. J quickly became the ABA's greatest asset. Claiming two ABA titles and three MVPs over three seasons, Irving had implemented an unmissable fan-drawing style of winning basketball that helped keep the league afloat for that much longer. However, for the failing ABA, all that did was postpone the inevitable. In 1976, the NBA-ABA merger saw the NBA acquire four of the ABA's franchises, helping them survive whilst their league folded. Amongst them were Irving's New York Nets. Unfortunately for the Nets, they were immediately ordered to pay a $4.8 million compensation fee to the New York Knicks for invading the New York market. Strapped for cash, the Nets had no choice but to sell their franchise player when the Philadelphia 76ers came knocking. When Dr. J entered the NBA, he did so with an element of mystique about him. For many fans, Irving was a big name they heard about coming out of a league that was rarely broadcast. His penchant for flying in the late 70s quickly saw him become one of the most popular players in the league, and savvy brands sought to capitalize, with Doc becoming one of the first NBA players to start lending his name and image to brands. One of the most significant product endorsements was the sneakers he wore on court, the Dr. J Pro Leather Converse, one of the first signature basketball sneakers, paving the way for the thriving signature sneaker market market we know today. With Irving in their ranks, the Sixers were a regular feature in the latter stages of the playoffs, but made an unfortunate habit of falling at the last hurdle. 
That would change in 1983, where Philly acquired free agent and two-time reigning MVP Moses Malone. Malone had himself another MVP season with the Sixers, and he and Irving formed an unstoppable frontcourt. The addition proved to be the final spring in Philly's leap to an NBA title. Their postseason record of 12-1, which accumulated in a sweep of the Lakers in the finals, remains one of the greatest postseasons in league history, and finally gave Dr. J that NBA ring. Across 11 seasons in the NBA, Dr. J built quite the resume. He averaged 20 plus points for nine consecutive seasons. He won the MVP award in 1981. He made all NBA first teams five times, including four consecutive times between 1980 and 1983, and made the Eastern All-Star roster every season right up until his retirement in 1987. Loved even by his rivals, every game of Dr. J's final season drew sellout crowds as fans, players and coaches looked to give him a farewell tour worthy of his greatness. Along with his impressive hall of accolades, Dr. J retired having brought a degree of artistry into basketball, magnifying the spectacle and appeal of the NBA tenfold. One of basketball's most iconic players, a man whose showmanship laid the foundations for the golden era of the 90s, Dr. Julius Irving was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 1993. It's not about who can do it now, it's about who did it first. And BJ, when I think about sort of looking at those archive tapes and 1980 NBA finals, as Mo just alluded to there, and the way that Dr. J just dazzled everybody, made NBA history, what do you remember about those sort of things and those, those, that time more than anything else? Well, you know, Dr. J was, you know, he was the doctor. He made the house calls. He was the guy that I remember my, my, father and my grandfather would talk about talk about this young kid dr j you know dr j is operating during the game but before giving you know dr j we have to also you know talk about connie hawkins we have to talk about spencer haywood we have to talk about elgin baylor and all of these guys were high flyers as well in their own right and i think dr j was just a culmination of all of these other players and it really came together for him in the in the ABA platform. You know, Dr. J was a phenomenal player. One of the players that I wished I had an opportunity to, to play against, he retired a couple of years before I got to the NBA, but I've had numerous opportunities and numerous chance to meet him. And when you say a true gentleman, a true professional, I mean, Dr. J was larger than life and to be able to meet him and shake his hand. I mean, he has some of the biggest hands I've ever, you know, I've ever had an opportunity. I mean, when he shakes his hand, I mean, his hands comes all the way to like your elbow. It's huge. So <laughs> it's no wonder he was able to move the ball around and do the things he was able to do because he had these huge hands and just a true professional. And he's always a pleasure. Every time you see him, he always has a kind word. And he was really probably the first when the media and all the attention came into the NBA to take advantage of it and start branding before we really knew what it was. He was a true, true pioneer in his own right and what he was, you know, what he's able to become. And you know what? And we're still talking about him today. He is the true doctor of the NBA. Young Bucks watching this show right now, let me tell you, go and do your research, yeah? That is showtime at its finest, yeah? That's the perfect way to jump into our primetime preview. Since we're talking about showtime, let's talk about the games this weekend. Oh, yes, we have a double header for you this weekend. Start off on Saturday night, the Battle of Texas, always a perfectly build-up. On Saturday evening at AT&T Arena, the Spurs host the Rockets. It's always an interesting affair anytime you have primetime entertainment. And of course, James Harden is on your television screen. You know what time it is, 10 p.m. right there at Sky Sports Arena. Before we flip over to phase two of our watch along right here on Sky Sports, which will be available, of course, on the Sky Sports YouTube channel as well from 8 p.m. Chicago at Dallas. We thought, you know what, the Bulls are so good last week. They entertained us so well. Let's throw them back in the mix again. And look who they've got up against them. Luka, baby. Luka Doncic coming all the, off an incredible week. Player of the week in the Western Conference as well. His triple doubles, his amazing against Zach Levine. That is built to be amazing on Sunday night. Huh. Now let's break this down. Let's do this game by game because, look, both of those games, I would say, are interesting affairs from different sort of standpoints. But, uh, BJ, I want to talk about the Rockets first because they still haven't won a game on the road. And most people say right. when you're talking about road teams, it's more about chemistry and mentality. We've seen the off-season problems that they had with their star player. What do you kind of make of this Rockets start? 
Well, the Rockets are in a very peculiar situation because their star player has made it very clear what his ultimate goal is, and that's to get traded out of Houston. It puts everyone on notice. It puts the coaches in a very kind of, you know, weird or complicated situation. Nonetheless, they do have talent. When you look at their roster, you like their talent. I love, you know, the fact that, you know, when you say James Harden, Boogie Cousins, John Wall, Eric Gordon, you know, uh, you know, Woods, the kid over there, they just got picked up in free agency. You look at this team and you say, they're kind of interesting on paper. Now, it hasn't happened for them. They haven't had a lot of time together on the court. You know, James Harden missed all of training camp. They've had a game postponed due to various things, injuries and COVID, so forth and so on. So when you look at it and you go, well, they haven't been together for a long time. And you can see why they aren't that good, especially when they are on the road. I think if this team sticks it out and is able to develop some type of chemistry, I think this team could be okay. But right now, it doesn't seem that James Harden is changing his opinion or his views anytime soon. So I think it's going to be a tough year for them if they continue down this path. But, you know, overall, but you look at their roster, guys, I really like the talent of this team. And they look like they're a team with the right matchup. They could possibly do some things, especially in the playoffs. Mo, let's just get this statement out of the way. James Harden, still an incredible generational talent. We have to acknowledge that every time we bring his name up. But there is still a trade request that's hanging over this franchise at this moment in time. And do you believe that's maybe impacting their three and five start at this moment? You know, I guess it may be a little discouraging to his teammates, you know, because anytime someone demands a trade, you know, if they're on your team, they might want to take it personally and think, yo, why does he want to play with those guys instead of us? He thinks that they're better than us or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, these guys are professionals. They're there to do their job and their job is to go out, play basketball and win games. So I feel like it's not too much because of the trade request, maybe potentially because it's a new team. It's very different to the Houston Rockets team we saw last year. There's not much continuity with the exception of, you know, PJ Tucker, Eric Gordon and James Harden. None of the main pieces. Russell Westbrook's gone and they've added Boogie, John Wall and, um, you know, Christian Wood as well, who's made a huge impact. So, you know, it takes time for these teams to gel, especially when the chemistry isn't clicking as it should be. But, you know, they're extremely talented. I like what I've seen from them so far, especially getting Harden and Gordon involved in off-ball actions and, you know, letting Wall orchestrate the offense, which is a big change from a lot of what we've seen from Houston over the past few seasons, which is, you know, James Harden dominating with the ball in his hands. It's nice to see, you know, him giving up some of that, uh, domination of the ball and giving Wall some freedom to, you know, run some more of that offense and him trying to get easier looks off the ball. So it's going to be an exciting matchup. And of course, the Spurs are never, never an easy opponent to go up against. Over, you've always spoken so glowingly about the San Antonio Spurs and especially, obviously, Hall of Famer Greg Popovich. Just talk about how he manages to do this over and over again. And even every time people look at that squad and they look at that roster at the beginning of the season and say, where's the star? Where's the output? Where's the three point shooting? Somehow, Again, the system seems to work. So what are you expecting from the Spurs going into this one? I mean, you can say, um, you know, where's the star and, and all of these other kind of things. But at the end of the day, you've got a team that's um, that's got a veteran. There's, there's a veteran squad there with a lot of pieces that have been around in this league for a long time. Uh, you've got guys that have won championships and you've got a, a Hall of Fame coach. So I think uh, any time you mix all of that together um, and, and, and you... You add that with the culture that I think uh, the Spurs are known for. I think they're always going to be a difficult opponent. I don't think at any point, you know, you can say you're going to go to the Spurs and get yourself an easy win. That's never going to be the case, regardless of what names are on the back of the jerseys. Um, and, and I think, you know, being a bit harsh, man, you know, DeMar DeRozan, Pat uh, Mills, you know, they've got... Um, a uh, big fella in the paint, Aldridge. Like, they, they still got some guys over there, you know? So I, I don't think it's a team just to turn your nose up uh, by, by any chance. But I do think it could be a very tough win uh, for, for the Rockets to get on the road, given their whole situation. Oh, I know that the Twitter timeline is going to be juicy on Saturday night because the San Antonio Spurs UK fans, they are very, very active anytime the Spurs are playing well. Let's flip over to Sunday as well because I promise you one thing, guys. I'm going to try to sort my Wi-Fi out so that I'm not late to the show as I was last time. But more than anything else, more than anything else, more than anything else, I'm leaving this one, OV versus VJ, because this is where you guys want to talk about 
your great players and your great players and your this. BJ, we know your affiliation with the Chicago Bulls, legend that that franchise and over. We know your affiliation with Luka Doncic because you've spoken about him glowingly since the beginning of his career back at Real Madrid. So I want to go to Mo. <laughs> Mo, exactly me versus Luka Doncic. Exactly me versus Luka Doncic. You know, How are you expecting this one to turn out? First, first things first, I'm hoping that your Wi-Fi isn't acting like Pascal Siakam at the end of a fourth quarter and struggling to connect. I'm hoping that you're going to start this one, baby. There you go. I just had to go on, man. Second of all, second of all, I'm looking forward to this one. I'm going to be bringing the popcorn. I'm going to be seeing, you know, Ovi and, and uh, BJ's, you know, two respective teams, two adopted teams go up against each other. I'm also looking forward to seeing how many times JD says Luka Doncic. Because that's my favourite pronunciation of uh, everyone in the world in the NBA. <laughs> Luka Doncic is in the building. No, Doncic, two talented scorers. I think for everyone, first of all, before I even say anything else, shout out to everyone who tuned in the last weekend to watch the thrilling game between the Clippers and the Chicago Bulls. Mad love to all of you guys. We all saw the tweets. We all saw the love that you guys were showing. We appreciate that greatly. And we all saw the talent of Zach Levine. He came out, put up monster numbers. He showed that he can compete with the best of them. He can score with the best scorers in the league right now. And I don't even need to talk too much about Luka Doncic. You all know what this guy's capable of. And, you know, talking about best duos in the NBA, Paul Zingas might even be healthy and on the court for this one. So we're going to see when Ovi's talking about these two being one of the best duos in the NBA, we're going to see exactly just how good they are because they're going to come and they're going to ball out. And I think Paul Zingis can cause some real problems for the big men on that Chicago roster. Ovi, I love how the Mavs have kind of, let's say, revamped their form, especially last week, but especially after a slow start as well. Lucas seems to have found his legs after what was a lack of a preseason, you could turn around and say. And so what are you kind of expecting from your man? You talk about him so glowingly. What are you expecting from the man himself? Uh, I mean, Luca's going to control the game. You know, I'm expecting him to control the game. He's going to play his pace. Uh, and, you know, if, if it comes down to the wire and it's a close game at the end, you're going to look for him to take take big shots for those guys. Obviously, if, if Porzingis is um, cleared to play, that would be a huge addition for those guys and they'll be looking to work him back into the rotation and stuff. Um, and I think that could present a whole different uh, level of problems for those guys. Uh, I think we saw a Chicago team last week that turned the ball over a lot. Um, and I think against a team that has uh, such a great playmaking guard like Luka Doncic, who has such great vision and the wings that they have and the guys running the lanes that they do, um, if they turn the ball over at that pace, I think they could be in, in, in huge trouble. But... At the same token, you know, the Bulls, they, they, they play, we, we just saw them play a really tough game against uh, the Clippers who are considerably much, well, supposed to be a considerably much better defensive team. I don't know about Paul George in the last couple of minutes or last few seconds of the game. Uh, that's up for debate. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, they, they got hot from downtown. They're a team that's, they're not going to shy away from taking shots. And, you know, Levine, as, as much as he scored, you know, I think he, he was doing well at, at um, as the primary initiator of the offense for those guys. So uh, I think it's going to be a really, really tough game. I think it's going to be a good one, honestly. BJ, the Bulls continue to build on what's been an impressive start under Billy Donovan. I've seen growth in Zach Levine, Denzel Valentine, Wendell Carter. We, we've seen them all. They they all seem to be buying into the system and buying into his philosophy more than anything else. From what you saw last week going into this week, how excited are you to watch the Bulls again? Well, Coach Donovan is a Hall of Fame coach uh, at the collegiate level, and he's coming in. He's really made his mark at the professional level as well. And the thing I like that he's doing is that he is playing to the strength of his players that he currently has on the rosters, right? And at the beginning of the season, the ball was in Kobe White's hands, and then suddenly they made some adjustments, and now you're seeing – Zach Levine as the primary ball handler. So he's making adjustments on the fly doing this season as he goes along. And right now they have some players that are out. Laurie Markkinen, he slides in and he's, you know, moving players around and they're getting results. They've had some really nice wins. The thing that I do like early about this team is the following. Zach Levine and Kobe White at the guard position. I'm not sure if either one of them 
is or their primary position would be the the primary ball handler. But together, the the combination of both, they figured out how to play together and they're doing something very positive. So I do like that. Wendell Carter is coming along. I like the growth of the young players and they have been competitive early in the season. Now, the one thing that comes with all of these numbers, Zach Levine, because he's putting up phenomenal numbers. I mean, the last game he had like 38, 39 points or so forth. And he's putting up big numbers. With those numbers comes the responsibility of how does it translate to wins and losses in this league? That is the next step for his career. But overall, I think you're starting to see this talent come together in some fashion. But now they have to put it together where it says, this is how we're going to win. This is Chicago Bulls basketball. That always starts on the defensive end, I think, and then it translates offensively. But right now they are playing well with the exception of turnovers. You know, this team is a team that can win. So, um, you know, look for the Bulls to continue to to make growth and development. But most importantly, look for them to be competitive in games. And that's a big step for the Chicago Bulls in this young franchise. Incredible doubleheader of action we've got going up this weekend. Before we go, gents, you know, we need to turn around and, and look at before we go. Come on. It's, it's fantasy time because, you know, the people always want to know. We have obviously our heat check fantasy league. Obi, why you look so disappointed? Oh, my gosh. And look who's... <laughs> It's, it's a surprise. No wonder why you want to. No wonder why you want to look. I mean, no wonder I mean, why. Like I said, shout out again to Adam. Shout out Nick. Shout out Daryl. But certain people are making advances in this league. Up sixteen places. Thank you very much. <laughs> last week, all right, Adam, step your game up. Yeah, there's COVID changes. Everything else needs to be done. Step your game up. I'm holding it down for I'm the still trying family. To figure this but he's out, not going to start looking at that. We ain't got no game. Come meet me on the court if you think that. But, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. How are you going to come and tell us we've got no game? Are you silly? Uh, but I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how this fantasy stuff works, man. I have got penalised points for changing too many players last week. And then, so then this week, I just didn't change anyone because I didn't want to lose points. So I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know, know how to change again. players. I don't know what's going on. This <laughs> what happens when you become big time and you're on TV every week. You got your assistants telling your assistants, "Look, you need to be sorting out my changes. What's going on here? Read the rules. Uh, yeah, get advice. Read the rules." <laughs> like I Jenny said, talking like he's not fifty seventh in the league. <laughs> 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 like right, he's well, I'm an Orlando Magic fan. This is a very good season for us right now. Yeah, this is a very good season. <laughs> Mediocrity is birthed into the NBA from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> look, salute to you guys. Yeah. Shout out to you as always. I can't wait to see you look this weekend. Make sure you dub- check out our doubleheader. Obviously, the battle in Texas is going to be a big one between the Rockets and the Spurs. And then us, we're back for our watch along as we chop it down. Zach Levine, Luka Doncic. Say no more. We'll see you Sunday, 8 p.m. That's what's YouTube. Sky Sports. Feel it all.